Okay, so um, we will now start. Uh, alors, bonsoir à tous, good evening, good afternoon, bon après-midi, dépendamment de là où on est. Um, this uh, session uh, will be recorded, uh, so it will be on social media. Of course, we may not be so many this evening because for, for a lot of us, it's it's complicated, it's, com it's becoming a... Uh, holiday season with, with everything going on, but nevertheless, it will be on social media, it will be on YouTube, and it will be also accessible by, uh, on our website. De sorte que finalement, on va vraiment retrouver uh, l'ensemble de la discussion que nous aurons. I'm, I'm very pleased to chair that uh, session. My name is Michel Rivet. I am uh, the vice chair of ICOM uh, Canada. And uh, I think we, it, this is a session that we want to have it so much because for, for ICOM Canada is, uh, is um, I will say, is, is, is very important. What is so important is the fact that uh, we give bursary to students, to students to attend Uh, to attend a Prague uh, ICOM and Triennial Conference, either in person or uh, by, 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 uh, by, not by Zoom, I don't know which word, but uh, uh, not being in person. Um, if I may, and I will introduce after our panelists, but if I may, I just want to say a few words about uh, that these bursaries. Um, these bursaries are, 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 are given to help emerging, emerging professionals in building networks and lasting connections. So ICOM Canada provides an annual bursary to support the participation of these students to, to a special event. And this year, of course, we choose uh, the Triennial uh, Prague Conference which uh, took place by, at the end, the end of August. So um, Sophie Zhu attended it virtually as ID Weber was there in person. And uh, we, want, we really want to give benefit to either someone who is at the beginning of, this, of, of, her, of his studies or maybe at the end of it. So this is a reason we have now these two, these two This to person is to person who won this bursary. We had we had more than 12 candidates this year, so it was quite complicated. So and we were sure that we choose the best one. But what can be said though that for the one who are not chosen this year, well, you can apply next year. It won't be, of course, a try and all ICOM conference, but nevertheless. It will surely be of interest. You can apply, you can have the bursary only once in a lifetime, but you can apply again if you didn't get it this year. So I will first introduce uh, Sophie Zhu that you can see on the screen. I never met in person Sophie Zhu. So Sophie, I'm, I'm very pleased to, to meet you this evening. So I will just give a, a, few, uh, a few notes on, on Sophie, uh, on her resume. And after that, she will address us for the time if she wants. Of course, not more, please, Sophie, than 20 minutes, maybe around 15, depending on what you want to, to say. And after that, we'll have A.D. Weber. And after that, a discussion, a conversation. I just repeat, though, that it will be registered, meaning that the one who will intervene already accept that it will be registered. So, Sophie, my Sophie recently completed Centennial College postgraduate certificate in museum and cultural management. Combined with her background in teaching, she hopes to use her experiences in the museum field to continue exploring the possibilities of public history and informal learning. She is currently work at Alpha Education a non-profit organization that promotes a critical historical inquiry of World War II in Asia that contributes to peace and reconciliation. And we see also on our screen, Heidi. Heidi, I will not introduce you now. Bonsoir, Heidi. So, Sophie, now the floor is yours. And please tell us 
what it was about that track conference. Does it work to attend it virtually? What have you learned? Have you learned something? And what do you expect maybe for the next one or for the future? So please, Sophie. Thank you, Michelle. Uh, it's really nice seeing you in person as well, since we've never met, but we've corresponded through email. And hello, everyone, as well. So let me just get my screen ready. Oh, uh, I am not allowed to screen share right now. What, you want to share your screen? Uh, if that's possible for my slides. Yeah, I will ask Sarah. Uh... Sarah Khan. Well, we have a coordinator for this uh, this evening. It's Sarah Khan, and it's, it has to be done through Sarah Khan, I think. Okay. So, Sarah, could you uh, could you accept that Sophie share her screen? Hello. Yes. Give me one moment. I'm going to make you a co-host, and you should be able to share in a moment. Sure. Thanks. Sarah, it's great. All right, great. I think you should be able to see my screen. Yeah, that's fine. Uh, Sophie is great. Okay, wonderful. Uh, so again, good evening, everyone. Um, for those of you who are here, thank you for coming. Um, so as uh, Michelle said, I went to the conference in a high, um, online uh, because this is the first year that the conference was offered in a hybrid mode, uh, being that you could that there were things that's in person as well as online. A lot of the sessions were um, recorded. Um, so this is an overview of my presentation. So to start off with, I just wanted to very briefly um, introduce the theme of the conference, which many of us would know was the power of museums. Uh, th that was this year's conference theme. And throughout my time at the conference and sometime afterwards, when I was thinking about my experiences and what I learned and what I got away from it, or even just the general questions I had, these were the three major questions or topics that were in my mind. Uh, which is what power do museums have in the face of large-scale transformations that's happening in the world? Um, do museums indeed actually have power? And how does the power of museums interact or intercept with whatever uh, power the rest of the community have? Because museum is just one institution among many in our world. So these three questions, um, I will kind of touch upon them um, for the rest of my presentation. And my presentation um, is kind of divided into three major themes. There are other themes, but I thought these were the three major ones that I um, noticed. And the first theme would be the global and regional changes in the world. Um, and I think we all understand that the world has changed many times over since the last um, ICOM conference in the past few years. So one of the biggest topics during the conference that I noticed was the war in Ukraine, which started in um, earlier this year. And when I attended the session on, I believe, I don't remember the exact word, I think the heritage protection, a session on Ukraine, um, a representative from ICOM Germany said something that really, um, that really, resonated with me was that he said that in the early stages of the war, ICOM Germany, the agency was the most prepared agency in the country of Germany, uh, which was really interesting. And as well, there were talks of an emergency red list to be made. And this was actually just published not too long ago. And this really show these two examples shows the power of museums or institu museological institutions like ICOM can have in determining uh, what is valuable to people and how we can even protect people. At the same time, I feel like these two are also examples to uh, the limitations of the power of museums, because while it's really nice that ICOM Germany had 
uh, the power and resources to be helpful in the cases of war. Um, the representative from MyCom Germany also said he was he felt a war that they like he and his team felt left alone by the German government and ICOM International. And that's also resonating with me as well. It's because sure, ICOM Germany is, you know, not not powerful, but it's also just one small institution in a really powerful country like Germany and with a power, um, you know, not not powerful institution like ICOM International. So I was wondering how that kind of the network of power and agency had in in the in the scale of change as well um on the session i believe with southeast european countries they were talking about emerging sorry now emergency just red lists in general they also mentioned how they had to work museums had to work with institutions like customs border control and the police department and that also realized that um, the power of museums is also contingent on other institutions enacting their power in a similar way towards a similar goal, because um, with without law enforcement or the government, um, it's really hard to make any use of a, a red list of you know heritage objects that needs to be protected. It's not enough to just say that these need to be protected. They need to there needs to be action. So that kind of complicates the ideas of the power of museums for me in a really interesting way. Um, and the other changes um, that we have all seen as well is the ecological changes with disasters. And this was particularly um, a central theme in the, on the second day of the conference when Hilda Fla Flavia from, um, in the, of course, was an environmental activist, who is an environmental activist, spoke about sustainability um, issues. And this also just made me realize that museums also have the power um, or could have the power um, to collaborate with other professionals in other sectors so that museums are moving, kind of changing from just buildings with collections into more um, metaphorical or ideological spaces where a lot more people and institutions can work together. And um, the last big change since, I, I guess a few years ago is of course COVID-19, which is really precipitated a lot of other changes that uh, we have seen in the past few years. Of course, with COVID, many sectors and industry um, had to change the way they functioned. And many people had to, you know, move online. And of course, museums with uh, lockdowns and things like that, they had to rethink how they can function in a society where people literally cannot go to a museum. Um, a lot of museums, of course, if especially if they have more resources, would be able to, you know, make their collections more, uh, digitize their collections um, or come up with programming that could engage people from um, their homes, which leads me to technology. Uh, the second major theme throughout the conference. And of course, the most obvious thing with technology is the fact that I went to the conference without leaving my home. Um, you know, again, this I mentioned this before. This was the first time the conference was um, done through a hybrid format, and I think again, this is a major change since the pandemic started. A lot of things now are in hybrid formations, or just pure online formations. Online webinars like this one are a lot more common now. A lot of people are okay with doing online things, where a few years ago we never even thought of doing these things. And of course, it comes with the typical pros and cons. Of course, the pros of a hybrid format of the conference is that um, people like me could go or people who just didn't want to travel a lot or couldn't travel for whatever reason um, could still connect with um, you know, their colleagues or learn something else so that information is not restricted to a physical time and space. Um, the cons, however, um, is that you know, not everything was um, recorded, for example, or more importantly, personal connections, right? When we go to conference or any social gatherings, there's the, person, there's the personal conversations that happen where you can learn so much and get so much from that. I just couldn't um, 
when I was sitting in my own kitchen looking at the laptop, um, right? And honestly, I felt a lot of, uh, I felt, sorry, I was going to say FOMO, that fear of missing out, the idea of fear of missing out when I was watching a lot because I knew there were a lot of also trips to other institute, other museums and institutions uh, for in-person um, attended attendees and I wished I could do that as well but it was still really nice. Um, I also attended um, several sessions on just use of digital technology collection management as well as educational technology and because I have a background in um, teaching classroom teaching that was really interesting to me so um, it got me thinking about the way that you know when we talk about the way that museums are changing their roles in society because of the different changes society is going through. Um, I feel like the pedagogical resource that museums can offer is still yet to be really um, tapped into. I feel like this is a big resource that would, um, not just museum professionals, but professionals of other in, in sectors like secondary education can tap into more and there could be more um, collaborations between these sectors. And um, lastly, on a more general note in this section, of course, technology for good or for bad has changed the way we connect and communicate. And on the, well, I think is generally a positive note. And in terms of um, during the conference, I also I realized that the way technology, when we talked about technology, is really a way to democratize and to decentralize. And there were a lot of talks of decolonization, of course, but decolonization, I think, is a more, spe a more specific sector of decentralization. And with technology, we are, or we as in um, museum industry, museum um the museum industry are more willing to not be the sole voice on a subject matter, and were, but rather just a place where a lot of narratives can come into play. And that brings me to my last section, which, um, you know, something we are probably all familiar with. Um, it made a lot of news in the museum world. Um, and that's, of course, the new definition of what a museum is. I'm not going to read it. It's quite long. We're, I'm sure we are all kind of familiar with it at this point if we don't memorize it. Um, but it is long. It is quite wordy. Um, I'm not going to say it's bad or good, but I think the length of this definition really reflects the complex nature of the world that we are having to grapple with. And when I say complex nature, I also just mean that the, we are seeing more complexities than maybe we have been before. Not to say that the complexity isn't all, um, wasn't already there, because as I've said earlier, just a couple minutes ago, um, there are a lot more narratives and voices coming out. Whereas maybe a few years ago, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, whatever, however many years ago, these voices might have been more marginalized uh, due to a variety of reasons. Um, but with the things, way things are going because of technology, because of social changes, uh, we're more willing in as a rule to listen to other perspectives or to consider other perspectives. And with that being said, there are literally a lot more voices and narratives coming in, which means that, sorry, I think, I, are you still seeing my screen? Sorry. Yes, we can still see it. Okay, great. Something just happened on my computer. That's why I was a bit confused. All right, uh, I'll just continue. Um, where was I? Oh, yes. So because there are uh, literally more uh, voices, I think this definition really does kind of reflect just how much we have to grapple with. And that could be a really exciting thing for museums because, as I've said, museums are changing uh, the, the role of museums is changing and having all of these, you know, aspects of museums possible, I think it's really exciting for museums across the world to think about what they want to focus on because every museum is different. They all want to do something different depending on, you know, the people who work there and the communities that they serve. Um, one last thing I would say about this uh, was 
uh, something that I heard at the presentation where uh, they revealed the new um, definition, which was an audience. I think it was a question, but it could have been a statement as well. But someone from the audience said that this museum, or they didn't think that the museum, the new definition was progressive enough. And that really stood out to me, not because I disagree with her or agree with her. I don't have much of an opinion on that side, but I just found that that was such a subjective point of view. And that made me think about the idea of a perspective, you know, whose perspectives are we uh, thinking about or coming from, from. And that also leads me to my concluding thoughts. Uh, the idea of perspective. Um, I know ICOM is an international organization. It's International is in the name of the organization, but uh, this could also be totally my bias from attending the conference from online where I know that I didn't see a lot of it. I only saw what I the few sessions that I attended um, and what I saw online. But it did feel, ICOM does feel like a very European um, organization, which makes sense because a lot of museology is very European and ICOM itself is registered in France. Actually, I learned that only French documents are legally binding uh, from ICOM uh, because they're registered in France. So that was a fun fact that I learned. And ICOM doesn't have a lot of official languages that its documents are translated into. Um, and that was a big point of contention in some of the sessions um, I attended, just various sessions talking about how ICOM should have you know, more languages, um, more official languages at least, and how the difficulties with that is that because it is registered in France, even the other languages are not going to be legally binding, um, or that there are difficulties with translations because language is always going to be tough to tough to do across the board. But I do think, as just a concluding thought, that um, this language issue is definitely worth a, a worthy project for ICOM International to undertake. Uh, if we're talking about decentralization and globalizing ICOM in the truest sense of the, wo the word, um, and you know, if museums are supposed to preserve and promote heritage and human experiences, I think it should definitely do so in at least more than three of these some 6,000 languages that are spoken or known by humans today. And uh, that's it for my presentation. Thank you to ICOM Canada for giving me this opportunity and thank you for listening. Bien, merci beaucoup, uh, Sophie. Je pense que ça a été uh, extrêmement uh, intéressant. Uh, les, les, les yeux que vous avez eus pour regarder l'intelligence que vous avez mise pour écouter, je pense, se traduisent effectivement des questions qui sont importantes. You raise, I think, very interesting questions. Well, I don't, I, I don't want to summarize all of them because it would, take, it would really take too long and uh, we, we may do, that, do so when we'll be in our discussion uh, period. What I just want to add before giving the floor to Ivy Weber is that, um, as I pointed out at the beginning, uh, this year we had really fantastic, all years, of course, but this year, I'm speaking about this year, we have very fantastic candidates. So we decided to, to give two bursaries. And what we did was, well, okay, let, let's split it. We give a bursary for the French, French speaking students and we give as first language, and we give a bursary, a bursary for the English speaking uh, students, the, the dividing mm -hmm. away the Canada. Not meaning though that uh, this evening, uh, I will be uh, speaking in French, you can address in French, I do. you can address in English. Being in Canada, you might prefer to address in English. What I just want to point out um, uh, is the fact that uh, we, so we, we, we put in place a committee to decide because we, all these candidates, they were so interesting. And um, uh, Sarah Carlock, who is, um, who is the secretary of the board for ICOM Canada, was the chair of that uh, committee. And um, I think that we achieved a great work because we have the two, the two bursary, the two, the two one that we honor, I think they really deserve it. 
So before giving you the floor, ID, I will just say a few words about about you. I will say it uh, in English, if I may, uh, ID. Bien. Um, so uh, Heidi Weber is a doctoral candidate at, in the Mun in the Muse Museology Mediation Patrimoine Program at University du Québec in Montreal, following a degree in Heritage Studies at University Laval and a Master in Museology at University de Montréal, she has chosen to pursue a doctorate in order to further museology research in Quebec. She is a member of the CELAT, or CELAT, uh, the, the acronym is the Centre de Recherche Culturelle et Société, and of the Chair de Recherche La Gouvernance des Musées Le Droit de la Culture. Her research, and I will just say a few words about your research if I may, I did, uh, her research um, focuses on the object in, uh, inside exhibit, the way the visitor encounters them, and the meaning-making process that occurs during that time. She's interested, interested in understanding the different factors that influence these encounters, such as the scenography, the writing, the architecture, as well as the more personal factors, such as the visitor connection to certain objects. So Sophie was with us online, virtually in Prague. Ivy was with us. I mean, with us because I was in a few colleagues of mine. Of course, we were in person in Prague. So Ivy was, uh, was with us uh, in person. So Ivy, uh, the floor is yours. Tell us what you think about that Prague conference, if you have learned something, and what should be the future made of. I dit, je te laisse la parole. Tu peux aussi bien intervenir en, en anglais, en dire un peu en français. C'est vraiment comme, comme, comme tu le veux. So, I dit, please. Merci, uh, Michel. Thank you, Michel. So, I, will, I have prepared uh, my presentation in English, as I thought that uh, the majority of people in it attendance would be more uh, familiar uh, with this. So um, I'll just share my screen as I have a... Um, um, hang on. Even after th three years, still can get the hang of this. All right, so can everyone see my screen? Okay, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Um, all right, how am I? Yeah, this is gonna to be tough. How, okay. Um, apologies, I need to be able to see my screen to see my notes uh, for my presentation. I have, I had not thought of that. Uh, so what I will do is just like this, and um, I hope you will forgive me for this lack of, uh, yeah, let's do it like this. So um, I would like to first apology, apologize for my late arrival. I had an unforeseen um, problem I had to take care of. Took care of. So um, as Michelle said, I had the great pleasure of being in Prague uh, in person for the uh, 2022 ICOM General Conference. So uh, this presentation will not be a comprehensive review of all my experience, as I could probably talk about it for like an hour or something. But uh, I thought that I would share an overview of some of the discussions and themes that were presented during uh, this week, that week. So uh, um, I'll start with a brief word on the place where the conference was held. So uh, the conference was held in Prague, which um, was it was my first time going there, and I thought it was a wonderful setting for a conference about museum. Uh, we've been told many, many times uh, by various guides, various people who live there, uh, locals, who uh, that Prague is an open city museum uh, because you can walk within the five boroughs of the city and go through about five hundred years of history in under thirty minutes. Um, the various museums, the historical sites, the garden, the bridges, the towers, they all have a unique, they all in, they're all individually unique and they all come together to create an incredible experience. So to have a conference on the power of museum in a place where you can feel this power every time you walk inside a museum was really truly a, a good choice, if I may say, if I can say so. So, uh, like Sophie said, uh, the theme of the conference was uh, the power of museums. So 
faced with the deep changes that are affecting our societies in recent years, um, the fractures and the tension that have come to the surface, uh, museums have positioned themselves as places to learn about the past and to be open to new ideas in order to create a better future. Um, this position that museums can be important points of support in their communities is directly opposed to the one that says that museums should be set on fire because they are a remnant of another era. The choice of this team for the conference was intended to allow participants to discuss and reflect on the places of museums and how this institution can be a vehicle for power and empowerment for those who use it and frequent it. What emerged from the many presentation, however, was that it is not the institution as such that holds the power, but rather the humans that are inside of it. Um, the many presentations and discussions uh, in the various committee, I think, supports this conclusion. Um, professionals have proven that they are the ones who brings about uh, changes in the mindset and practices of their institution. The power does not lie with the museums, but with the museum's professional. So um, I will briefly look at what the four main uh, keynote speeches told us uh, to exemplify that um, argument. So uh, the first keynote speeches was uh, on museums and civil society by Margarita Reyes Suarez. And she argues that uh, civil society becomes the one who wields the power of the museums because they are the one who uses it. That the community inside the museum is the one uh, that can make use of its power. The panel that followed that, keen, that speech exemplified that argument with concrete ex examples demonstrating that the museum is not is neither neutral or partisan, but it serves to show uh, the truth that what is inside will resonate with community and that conservation and preservation, of course, is important. Um, that the community that voluntarily donates uh, or exhibits its objects does so to educate and to show uh, what they are going through. So it is the member of the community that does it within the museum. Um, like Sophie said, uh, one of the most uh, memorable speeches was the one of Hilda Flavia Nakabuye, who's touched on subject like uh, the climate crisis, natural disaster, and a call for action, uh, a call to action for people all around the world. It was so, so uh, moving that uh, she got a standing ovation. Um, which, which shows that the conference participants are aware of the drastic changes that are coming to the planets and the places that the museum must take in the fight against climate change. Uh, however, it is the call to youth, I think, that resonated the most, as they are often the one who we try to bring inside the museums and with various success. Uh, their involvement in issues that affect them directly and their act active participation would be a way to interest them, to give them a voice. It is to give them a form of power within an institution that can contribute to education and transmission of contemporary values. Um, we, we also had a very interesting one on uh, museums and leadership by Looney J. Bunch III and Hilary Carty, uh, where they talk about how inside the museum you have to work with compassion and look for what will resonate with people. Uh, Mr. Bunch III said that museum must help people. Quote, um, the people inside the museum works toward that goal and the leaders even more so as they lead by example. Quote, leadership is about the greater good, end quote. Because change affects the employees as much as the leader, all work must be cooperative. That beyond personal glory, leader must go above and beyond to make employees feel supported and valued. Uh, again, this intervention was met by applause uh, by the audience. 
More than any other intervention, both speakers anchored the principle that the power of the museum lies with those on the inside, that they are the one who will help make museum a place of value and respect, open to all. And that is, I think, the true power of museum. And finally, uh, we also had a talk on uh, museums and new technology. As Seb, Seb Chan uh, demonstrated, the opportunities that technology promised us 20 years ago, such as globalization and freedom of use, have not materialized. Uh, monetization is common and rapid change means that the use of new technology in museum is associated with huge cost. Uh, he spoke about how difficult it is to use this technology to attract museum goers and especially for museums to understand how to use it. Uh, one of the panelists put it, I think, perfectly, quote, good technology is good, bad technology is bad, end quote. It's worse to implement a system that doesn't work and will disappoint users than to not have one. Technologies can be positive, but it can also have a negative impact if it's not used properly or if it comes with too much dependency. Um, here, I would like to just uh, briefly talk about how during the museum show, uh, much was made about NFTs and how that was where museums should go, uh, should basically pour all their resources into. Um, this need to sell that technology and to make it understandable, illustrate the chasm between logical and relevant use of technology and blind reliance on it to attract audiences. Uh, however, the NFT market has since crashed, so Let's not rely on that too much. Um, but the big moment I am about during the conference was, of course, the new definition. So uh, as everyone know, the definition that was presented in Kyoto in 2019 uh, was controversial because of its wording and content. Um, the highly engaged social aspect has led to some concern that some museum would no longer be able to use that definition. And more importantly, uh, the notion of a socially engaged museum is not, was not, and is not uh, universally accepted. And also the removal of certain functions such as education and collection had also been the subject of controversy. Uh, so faced with this, the ICOM defined committee embarked on a three year journey of consultation, reports, webinars, surveys in order to know what the museum community around the world wanted in the definition. Uh, during their presentation, the co-chairs of this committee detailed their methodology, their choices, their reasoning, etc. Uh, we really felt in the audience that they did not want a repeat of 2019. They were very transparent about the process, about how they came to this proposed definition, its limitation, and the critiques that were put forward. However, uh, what was most striking for me was the admission that the definition that would be adopted uh, might need some review sooner than one might think. And uh, they even uh, posited that even at the next conference, we might need to update the definition. Uh, this highlights the fact that museum changes very quickly and needs to be need, that a definition is hard to it's hard for a definition to encompass everything that a museum is. However, um, aided by the incredible amount of consensus in the building, the vast majority of the intervention from the audience was focused on the exceptional work that was done by the co-chairs and the committee as a whole. Um, there, I, I, there was a lot of discussion about the translation of the definition. Uh, like Sophie mentioned, um, ICOM only has three official language, so French, English, and Spanish, and the committee only presented an official definition for these three languages. Any committee that uses another language has to translate themselves and in or, and try and keep the, the spirit of the definition. So that was uh, something that we felt could be, what's the word? A point of contention in some committees. Um, so the, the uh, 
definition was adopted by 92%, uh, which gave ways to big celebration across the room. Um, to have a new definition for professionals uh, mean a new mandate, as well as broader recognition of the social role of museum by an international uh, organization. So um, that was the during the three days. I've also I also attended some uh, committee meeting like ICAFOM or SICA, uh, which I am most uh, active in. However, I think it more um, appropriate to talk about my experience at the offsite meeting. So. I went to the SICA, the Committee for Education and Cultural Action of Meeting Sites. And I feel like my experience there really uh, shows what is the power of museum and my own personal conclusion that this power is the people. So um, the majority of the presentation during that day were based on digital projects or projects that require the use of technological tool. Um, one participant uh, noted that it can be difficult for some museums to implement such projects due to lack of funding. Uh, some media mediation projects always require a major and long-term investment. Apps must be constant, constant, constantly updated and redesigned based on users and the potential changes in the exhibition. Some project requires private sponsorship to implement, others demand considerable human and material organization and management. So it seems that to set up a mu museum mediation project that you need a dedicated team, a good internet connection and money. So is that where the museum is heading? Maybe. But it's important to underline that all the projects that were shown during that day are carried out by human beings. That behind the money and the various resources, people believe in their project, that they will go and find the necessary resources or make do with the means in hand. That to transmit a passion or just information, you need a human being first. Um, beyond the interactivity of an app, a contact with an educator can create a satisfying experience in the museum. And that brings us back to the fact that uh, the power of the museum belongs to those who works in these institutions. So um, in conclusion, I'll just say briefly a couple of words about my own personal experience there. So as I said, it was my first time going to an ICOM conference and um, my first time uh, in Prague. So that was a double very enjoyable for me. Um, I enjoyed this conference because it was a time of intellectual activity that was beneficial to my, re my own researches, but also because it allowed me to discover a city that I was not familiar with uh, through the guided tour, the organized excursion and personal visit in the city and its museum. It was uh, rewarding to see how museology is being viewed elsewhere. Um, at the same time, the lectures, the committee meeting, and uh, let, let's be frank, the coffee breaks uh, were great places for discussion, discovery, putting my researches into perspective while connecting with other professional or students. Um, I think that uh, at ICOM Canada hosted the Breakfast of the Americas, which was really a fantastic moment. We had the, uh, the, 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 the what was it called? The, first night where it, pour, it was raining, but it was such a great moment. And then the last night, and it was just a great moment to just meet people and connect with other professionals. Um, I came away from this conference convinced that I wanted to work in museum and contribute to making them useful and relevant and open in society. Uh, it was also a moment, I also was lucky enough to present my research during the additional session of the SICA committee. So as a doctoral student, I was, those presentations are crucial in my, uh, my resume. So that was incredibly rewarding. However, and I will end on that note, I was disappointed to find that there were few other students present at the conference, or at least that it was difficult to find them. 
After Hilda Flaviana Kabuye's call on the inclusions of youth, I believe that ICOM should encourage more youths and students to participate in such event and get involved in committee. First, because it is a rewarding experience for a student to already be in touch with what is happening in the field, um, the academic world often exists in a vacuum, and it is important to get a feel of what life is inside the museum. And also, a student who gets involved early on can continue this involvement later on and become part of the next generation of ICOM member. Uh, secondly, because ICOM allows, and I've experience that personally, ICOM allows you to build a professional network around the world, which is very important in this field. Uh, we often talk about interdisciplinarity and multidisciplinarity in academic circle, but I think it is equally important to include authors from different parts of the world, which who may have a very different perspective on certain issue. So the next conference will be 2025 in Dubai, and it will certainly be a very important moment. Uh, beyond the chosen location, there will certainly be discussion on the new definition and its use by museum, on the social problems that we cannot yet anticipate today, as we could not anticipate the problems in 2019, um, on the place of museum in the world, et cetera. However, my wish for this 2025 conference is a greater inclusion of young people, either through a committee dedicated to them or a specific meeting for them. Uh, because as the ICOM Prague uh, conference proved, the power of museum is in the hands of those who work in them. And the next generation, uh, the one that will work in museums, is the one that will have to face the changes of our time. And it is imperative that we listen to them. So in conclusion, um, I would like to thank ICOM Canada for the bursary as it helped me go. And it will certainly remain a high point in my uh, professional life because um, it was just such a great experience. So, and I look forward to be more, to getting more involved with ICOM Canada uh, and ICOM in general going forward. So uh, thank you for uh, listening to me. So, oh, thank you so much, I do. I think that you presented, the conclusion of presentation is that, well, I can say though, you were sort of enthusiastic about the Prague conference. So I think it's absolutely great. You really mentioned how the uh, keynote speak, the, the speaker captured the importance of civil society in the museum, the importance of youth involvement, the importance of, of the leaders, and also that, uh, well, the system should reflect what the, what the, the society serve uh, need. So I, I think I think I think it was it, it was you know, presentation was interest as the one of course of uh, of Sophie and Sophie uh, talked to us about the power to change, the power to connect, and the power of meaning. And of course, both of you uh, presented the finally museum definition that was adopted, uh, early adopted by 92%, as you mentioned, Ivy. And I think, uh, Sophie, you pointed out very correctly uh, the, a comment of someone who said, well, maybe the, the, the museum definition is not progressive enough. And that was, that was said in, in several uh, coffee break, meaning that in a way, to arrive to a museum definition, we have to arrive to sort of a consensus. And of course, the consensus does not translate exactly what, what a, a specific ICOM country will want. But nevertheless, I think that for the time being, at least we arrived to, uh, to a museum definition, as in Kyoto, it was, it was a tsunami and nothing was going on. And it seems that ICOM was almost ready to collapse after, in, in, in Kyoto, you know, we were really, uh, seeing a, a, an immense a tragedy. Uh, Sophie, you mentioned, I think, and I think that uh, that uh, information should really be given to ICOM, and, to ICOM International, and we will, we will do so. We will, ICOM Canada, we will 
think that will th that in a way um, when a conference is hybrid because of course as you mentioned is the first to be hybrid uh, uh, but when a conference is hybrid for the one who are online it, it, we should try to have them even more involved uh, maybe in some in some some sessions in some type of online coffee break or discussion so that that will permit the um, the, the, the many because we have many many people attending online to, to really be much more uh, much more part of in a way not only in a way listening to to speeches so i think i think that point was was important as many other points i just i just have to wrap up so briefly um, i dimension and it has to be said that of course there was a three days plenary session but beside that, there was also some international committee meetings. And we have, of course, we all know, but it has to be uh, said again, that we have 33 international committees. So the, the 33 national, international committees meets for the, la the last two days. So it's a big, 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 big endeavor that the um, that ICOM Triennial Conference um, having said that, of course, I want again to thank you, uh, Sophie and Heidi, and just to say on behalf, but after I will open the floor for questions if some, but I just want to say that on behalf of ICOM Canada, I think that we really make the best choice, having Sophie and having Heidi with us. So um, we don't have much time, but nevertheless, are there some questions or some comments that... Uh, one, so one might want to to make. Um, please go on. Uh, I think that Sa uh, Sarah Carlot may want to. Please, Sarah, go on. Hello, Sarah. I, I just wanted to say, um, I you know echo what Michelle said and say that you know you guys obviously you two had a really um, engaging time and I'm really glad that we could support you and uh, you know Heidi. I think your um, comment about the student gathering or the young people's gathering is a really good one and um, the Canadian Museum Association it was actually a group of young people decided to start having emerging museum professionals meetings um, as part of those so I encourage you I'm sure there are other people who might feel that way and I encourage you for next time to try to put something in to say hey can you put an announcement in the program that says you know everyone under you know, 30 or whatever can come and meet us at this location, you know, to just get to know each other. I think that that's a fantastic idea. Um, but yeah, I'm really, I thought your presentations were both really wonderful. And, you know, I'm really glad that you got to represent us. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. <laughs> Other comments or questions? Or, Heidi, uh, do you want to react to what Sophie said? Or, Sophie, do you want to react to what Heidi uh, said? Floor is yours if you want. No, Heidi. No, Sophie. I was just um, wondering um, what, because obviously I was there, so I I wasn't aware what part. Sorry, what part of the conference was actually online, and which part weren't. So was it only like the mornings that were online and then like the committee meetings were not available or what, what was it like, um, Sophie? Yeah, so I do think um, obviously off-sites um, things were not online. Um, most of the sessions uh, like presentations were online other than the ones that were, um, I think on the on the on their website it says for members only so you have to be a paid member of icon mm -hmm. to join those um so for example the voting session for the definition it was not streamed online for a mm -hmm. regular um mm -hmm. person um the only thing was that the streaming service you can't you can't stream more than one so i wanted to have multiple tabs oh. open but you can't but it's okay they're recorded so okay. And did you have access to, because I know that uh, there was simultaneous translation, we, we could meet, I was there with two friends and we had lots to say about uh, lang the three languages, but we had trouble with the simultaneous translation. Was there the same issue online or was it better? Um, there were. Sophie? 
We don't seem to have um, Sophie. I don't see Sophie with us. Maybe she, her line was uh, yeah. was cut. Mm -hmm. But if, if I may just not, not answer, of course, because I was there, I was not online. Mm -hmm. But the, more than that is the fact that uh, when it's online, it should there should also be some rooms for uh, discussion for online uh, online and in-person uh, participants, you know, and mm -hmm. that, that, uh, that, was, that was not uh, the case. Well, I see the time going so fast. Uh, it's, uh, so I just want to remind us that, and, and to say to everyone that the first thank you, and also that uh, we are going to have that on our social media. It will be on YouTube and it will be accessible through the uh, the website. So uh, Sarah Khan, our coordinator, is there something else that should be said or do we have covered? Uh, the, the last word will be for you, Sarah. Uh, thank you. Um, no, nothing else to be said. I, oh, Sophie's coming back in though. She might have something to say. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> okay. So I think Sophie Zhu is, is is coming again with us. Yes, I'm so sorry. My computer just shut down. We lost um, you completely. I know. <laughs> Nevertheless, I was in the middle of a yeah. Um, sorry, Heidi. Um, the translations they were fine. Okay. Um, some sessions. Um, some speakers spoke in other languages other than like the smaller sessions committee sessions they spoke in um non-english languages thinking that they would be translated but they were not yeah um so i think that was probably an in-person thing too but yeah it was very disappointing when uh someone made a really wonderful presentation in french and then at the end realized that no one in the room had understood her and it was just heartbreaking yeah uh, it's the problem that i've been often in some international uh, yeah. okay so i think we have covered um, the, what we have to achieve this evening and i really want to thank everyone and of course uh, sophie and id both of our points were great we will see you now on social media and of course we really want you to continue to work for uh, for icom I, I think it's great i think it's important i think that you are the future so you are, this is you who, who will make at the end of the day, the difference. So not only you count on, on, we count on you, but you're the one who will have to act. I think Sarah, it, it will be fine to say. So thank you also Antonio to be with us this evening. So we just resume and say that, uh, well, uh, next time we'll be together. I hope maybe before Dubai, at least at Dubai. Okay. <laughs> So thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. Right. Thank, thank you. you so much. Thanks, Thanks Michelle. Thank you, everyone. Have a great night. You as well. Thank you. Goodbye. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.